Well, good morning, TLC Church. This is exciting. This is new. We are recording more or less live. We're doing this all in one take. So no matter what happens, this is one take. Megan might faint. Doesn't matter. We're doing this in one take. We're doing this for a very special reason. Basically, we want to feel like we're still here. We want everyone to feel like they're still at TLC on Sunday mornings, even though we're not. We've all been able to come down and do our respective bits, but you guys can still stay at home, in bed, cup of tea, cup of coffee, on the couch, wherever you are, but at least you can still feel like you're with us in this room. Because that's something I think that so many of us are missing. The fact that we can't gather together. But the great thing is, we're all together with Christ and through Christ. Christ is with us as we do this recording. Christ is with you as you sit wherever you are at present. We're united in Christ, though we're separated due to this last outbreak. So let's focus on that today and the joy of that. This is going to be a bit of a shorter service as we also try to condense these recordings because we know that you guys are sick of screens. So... Join us as we do this very experimental one-take sermon. It's quite exciting. We, and speaking of one-take, I better open up to the page I have my notes on. See, if this wasn't one-take, if I was recording this stuff from home, I would have gotten angry and restarted the thing then. But we can't. It's all one-take. How exciting. So we're continuing our series of looking at apologetics. This is the third sermon in the series and today we're going to hear from Mike who's going to guide us through the topic of how can we know that the Bible we have today is a reliable record of the original writings. That's a really cool topic. I'm looking forward to hearing from Mike as I know you guys will be as well. But before we get on to that, let's pray. Father God, here we are again. We're separated from each other due to forces beyond our control. We're a bit over it, and we just want the disruptions to stop. But we also know that you're with us in the midst of this. You hear our grumbles, but you also know that we, we need to be reminded that there's so much more going on in our world that also requires our prayers so as we pray to be together soon, we also acknowledge everything else that's going on in the world. We pray for those in Indonesia who are really struggling, those in India and around the world who are dealing with a far worse COVID situation than we are. So we pray for these cities, these towns, these countries, these places around the world, that they too can have some relief from this terrible COVID pandemic. In the midst of that though, Lord God, we know that you do hear our grumbles. You do know that many of us are struggling through increased mental strain and financial strain and all the things that go with them. You're a big God, you see the big picture, but you're a God that comes close as well and you know our hearts and what's going on in our minds. So we acknowledge that here and now. Amen. Well, before we hear from Mike, Let's join in worship. Please, I want to thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Well, our children's story this morning is called Just In Case You Ever Wonder, and it's by Max Licardo. It's written from the perspective of a parent to a child, but I think it's also a beautiful reminder about how God feels about every one of us. So enjoy this story, and the pictures will come up on your screen. Long, long ago, God made a decision, a very important decision, one that I'm really glad he made. He made the decision to make you. The same hands that made the stars made you. The same hands that made the canyons made you. The same hands that made the trees and the moon and the sun made you. That's why you are so special. God made you. He made you in a very special way. He made your eyes so that they would twinkle. He made your mouth so that you could smile. He made your laugh so that you could giggle. God made you like no one else. If you looked all over the world, in every city, in every house, there would be no one else like you. No one with your eyes, no one with your mouth, no one with your laugh. You are very, very special. And since you were so special, God wanted to put you in just the right home, where you'd be warm when it's cold, where you'd be safe when you're afraid, where you'd have fun and learn about heaven. So after lots of looking for just the right family, God sent you to me, and I'm so glad that he did. I'll never forget the first time I saw you. Your eyes were closed, your fingers were curled into two little fists, your cheeks were puffy and round. I knew in my heart that God had sent someone very wonderful for me to take care of. Your first night with me, I heard every sound you made. I heard you gurgle, I heard you sniff, I heard your little lips smack. I heard you cry when you wanted to eat, and I fed you. You're bigger now and do more things. You can walk and run. You can play and talk. You can eat and sing and look at books. You're not a little baby anymore. But as you grow and change, some things will stay the same. I'll always love you. I'll always hug you. I'll always be on your side. And I want you to know that, just in case you ever wonder, remember I'm here for you. On dark nights when you hear noises in your closet, call me. When you see monsters in the shadows, call me. On hard days when kids are mean and don't treat you like they should, come to me. If your grades are bad and your teacher is mad, come to me because I love you. And I always will, just in case you ever wonder. Most of all, I'm here to teach you about God. He loves you, he protects you, and he and his angels are always watching over you. And God wants me to make sure that you know about heaven. It's a wonderful place. There are no tears there, no monsters, and no mean people. You never have to say goodbye or good night or I'm hungry. You never get cold or sick or afraid. In heaven, you are so close to God that he will hug you just like I do. It's going to be wonderful. I'll be there too, I promise, and we'll be there together forever. Remember that just in case you ever wonder. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service today. Thanks, Megan. That was fantastic. I wish they had stories like that when I was a kid. Let's take a moment to uh, pray together. Lord, we ask that you guide our thoughts and minds as we expound the scriptures today, that we seek to understand what you want to say to us and what you want us to keep. And Lord, we pray that you would guide us in all that we learn today. I give you thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. 
uh, in 1970, Times Magazine announced that God was dead. And literally from that time on, we've actually been experiencing this steady erosion of absolute truth, that sense of what is true. And so, of course, now we have this state where everybody's idea is a state of truth. And in fact, in, link, in um, uh, LinkedIn, uh, I noticed there was a uh, post and it was espousing the fact that nobody had nobody's truth was any special, more special than anyone else. All truths were equal and everyone's truth was the same, which meant that essentially your truth was your truth, my truth was my truth, and therefore um, there is no competing thing other than you have to believe what I believe or you have your own story. Either way, it gets very confusing. How confusing? Let me read you a poem. Ladies and gentlemen, skinny and stout, I tell you a tale I know nothing about. The admission is free, so pay at the door. Now pull up a chair and sit on the floor. One bright day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back they faced each other, drew their swords and shot each other. A blind man came to watch fair play. A mute man came to shout, hooray! A deaf policeman heard the noise and came to stop those two dead boys. He lived on the corner, in the middle of the block, in a two-storey house on a vacant lot. A man with no legs came walking by and kicked the lawman in his thigh. He crashed through a wall without making a sound, into a dry creek bed and suddenly drowned. The long black hearse came to cart him away, but he ran for his life and is still going today. I watched from the corner of this big round table, the only eyewitness to the facts of my fable. But if you doubt my lies are true, just ask the blind man, he saw it too. In an age of no truth, narrative becomes personal truth. But personal truth is no more valid than anyone else's truth and everyone else's tr truth is competing. However, we have a shared story and that shared story is compelling. When I was in college, uh, I've actually done two bouts of sociology and the first time I did sociology, uh, we looked at the late 1900s. In the late 1900s, it talked about all the works that the Christians did in terms of social change and helping people and assisting people to change. Uh, and it was considered a really amazing act by Christians. Ten years later, I was doing structural social work from a feminist perspective, and the sociology looked at the same time period, 1900s. The only difference was, this time, it was the bourgeoisie imposing their values on the proletariat. The language had changed. All that was previously spoken about, which had been good, had been rewritten to be an imposition and something that was not as valuable. And of course, it's got a whole lot worse since then and we now see that people are constantly rewriting history. So as Christians, we have this dilemma. We have this book, this amazing book, the scriptures. This book has been with us for a long time, but is it useful? Is it reliable? Is it something that we can find is trustworthy? Well, first of all, let's deal with the Old Testament. Uh, for us as Christians, it's relatively easy to understand. Jesus fully accepted the Old Testament. He quoted from it, he spoke from it, he used it fully. It was a, never when he spoke did Jesus ever go, however, the Old Testament scriptures aren't true. He didn't say this book's not right, that book's not right. Jesus fully accepted the Old Testament. It was used and quoted by the disciples, fully believed and extensively quoted by Paul. So for us as Christians, we can comfortably sit with the fact the Old Testament is kosher. It's okay. It's something that we can actually accept fully without any difficulties. The reliability of the New Testament faces several challenges. Let me list off what some of those challenges might be. 
First, is Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, a real historical character, or are these counts more of a fictional story? Second, does the Gospel according to John contradict the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels? Third, is the early church history as recorded in the book of Acts historically accurate and coherent? Fourth, are the New Testament epistles written by the individuals purported to be their authors? And fifth, do other writings exist that should be added to the New Testament canon? Six, how can we be sure that the original documents have been faithfully copied and made available to us today? And finally, can we trust the reliability of books that record supernatural events like the resurrection of Jesus? That's a lot to cover, and I'm not sure we're going to cover all of those, but we're going to cover a number of them. First of all, at Jesus' time, the stories of Jesus' life was told orally over 40 years. Now, for us, stories told in one ear out the other because we are not a story people. We're not a people that are used to telling stories or listening to stories, even though we now talk about narrative all the time. But back then, people could tell a story could move somewhere else and tell the same story, perhaps with different movements and actions, but the story remained the same. And the story actually stayed with them. Now, I only had two accounts in my life when I think back about stories. And one was in Hyde Park. And I remember listening to a speaker, uh, and that would have been back in 79. And I still today can recount to you, word for word, what that speaker was talking about, the stories he used. I could tell them to you as if I was there. And yet I'm not a storyteller in the way of the old days. In the same way that in 1973, um, I can tell you about a message that David Bowen gave at the Sunbury Pop Festival. And I could actually recount word for word the message that he gave because it was so memorable to me. Now there are two accounts <clears throat> that I can remember where I can fully remember all these years later and can accurately recount them. So how much more important for us to recognise that at the time of Jesus people told stories, people remembered stories, people retold stories and people kept the stories accurate. Now the Gospels were put in writing between AD 60 and AD 90. Those dates are important, and you'll understand why in a few seconds. Because all were spoken of, sorry, the epistles of Paul, Peter, and John were written in AD 40 to AD 100. Okay? All were spoken of and written in living memory of those who could and would dispute the facts if they could. Roman and Jewish authorities alike. Because remember, let's face it, the disciples were talking about this amazing thing that had taken place that the Jewish leaders certainly didn't want to be accepted as fact. The Romans didn't want to accept it as fact. And so we actually had two major authorities who over the next 400 years would work their hearts out to actually stop this fledgling first group that came out of a, a, a sect, if you like, that came out of um, Judaism and then fully fledged Christian community amongst the Gentiles, they would have been stopped if the truth could have been told. And the answer was that they couldn't. Furthermore, when we go further into history, the early church fathers described the Gospels as the four pillars of the church. So as early as 100 AD, they were talking about the Gospels as being the pillar of the church. That meant that these documents that had been written down were already being used at a time when people who still could remember who Jesus was, still could remember actually being with Jesus, um, could actually say, yes, these accounts are true. These accounts make sense, or they're a lie, and therefore they shouldn't be listened to. So therefore, it's really important for us to grasp that if it could have been challenged then, it would have been highly challenged and dismissed. Now, obviously, things pass. And 
we need to understand that as time passes, surely those things could be messed with, changed, rewritten. Well, let's first of all talk about the word canon. Because the word canon literally means measuring stick. Okay? In other words, does it measure up to what is being talked about? Let's also look at the word Bible. The Bible, we know as one book. However, biblio literally means the books. And so what we have in our possession is the books of Scripture. These are the books that were assembled together as part of the canon. Now, it wasn't just that some people sat down and said, OK, let's decide which is in, which is out. But over the space of 200 years, the church had been using these passages, these letters from Paul, these letters from James, these letters from Peter. They were reading them in the churches every Sunday. Okay? The Gospels were being read in, this, in their meetings together. Whatever literature they had hold of, they were reading them in their meetings as they met together to celebrate the love feast. Because they only had two things that they practiced. One was baptism. The second one was communion. And they did communion as often as they could when they met together. However, the whole sense of what we have today, well, as early as AD 140, we find the church confirming all four Gospels, 13 of Paul's letters, as well as the letters of other apostles, Peter, James, and John, and the book now named the Acts of Apostles. Now, the early Christians used the following criteria uh, when they were identifying whether a book was actually legitimate or not for them. First of all, they looked at apostolicity. Oh, apostolicity. In other words, books coming from apostles or their close associates. In other words, first century works. Orthodoxy. That is, books carry on the storyline of the Israelite scriptures, internally consistent and in keeping with the earliest known apostolic teaching. Catholicity, well, that just means historicity, you know. Widely accepted as authoritative and relevant, not just limited to one location or sect within emerging Christianity. And finally, inspired, having the ring of truth and used by the Spirit for distinctly edifying and maturing purposes. So in other words, the materials themselves were judged quite soundly by things that we could judge today and go, yep, that makes sense. These actually do match those things. And I know when I read The Shepherd of Hermes and I go, interesting book, great things to read. However, does it match these? Now I can see why it didn't make a, get a Guernsey because it didn't resonate with those four things that the early disciples talked about. Now, one of the interesting things when you look at classical works is that it was so long ago, so how do we know that it's actually the same today as it was then? Okay? Now, on my bookshelf at home, there are a number of pieces of literature that uh, were written um, thousands of years ago. But they were, um, they were actually only produced, and the nearest copy of those, thing, of those pieces of literature is actually only a century ago. All the works before that have been lost. But we still accept those books as acceptable classical books in our Western tradition. However, when we come to the scriptures, um, People take a much sharper view and go, oh, no, sorry. Um, we need more information. We need more detail. We need more reasons to agree that this is actually the original material. So the good news for us is there in, is in existence right now over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, in whole or in part. The best and most important of these goes back to somewhere about AD 350. In other words, 350 years after Jesus' birth, they have the entire Bible as it was then, which is the same as we have it now, and the collection is the same. 
and we can read it. Not only that, um, we actually have two of these code. We have one that's the Codex, Codex, sorry, one the Codex Vaticanus, the chief treasure of the Vatican Library, and that's in Rome, and then the well-known Codex Sinaiticus, which the British government purchased from the Soviet government for a hundred thousand pounds on Christmas Day in 1933, and which is now the chief treasure of the British Museum. So there we have two complete books held in two separate places vouching the scriptures that we hold in our hands from as far back as AD 350, complete and intact for us to check out. Besides all of these other 5,000 Greek manuscripts that we get to actually check out and test little samples of, oh yeah, look, oh, there's a little piece there from Romans. Oh yeah, look, it does, it actually matches our Romans. Oh, nice one. Um, the two other important early manuscripts are the Codex, Codex Alexandrus, also in the British Museum, and that was written in the 5th century, and the Codex Bizet in Cambridge University Library, which is written in the 5th and 6th century, and that contains the Gospel and Acts in both Greek and Latin. So you see, over the years, as people wrote the stories and rewrote the stories and rewrote the stories and shared the stories, there may be a few minor things, but there's probably no more than about 300 in total um, of actual era, era, things that differ from one to another. Okay? And many of those are easily explainable, and none of them actually affect the deep and significant parts of theology and the things that we believe. So you see, the scriptures we hold in our hands have a solid historical background that we can feel comfortable with. Now, earlier I mentioned, you know, what about the supernatural? Well, the supernatural only works if I'm prepared to accept it. So if the people out there go, there's no such thing as supernatural, then they'll want to write out all supernatural and declare that any mention of those things in the scriptures is untrue, unreasonable, and unacceptable. In other words, it's about my belief here and now that judges what I read. But if I look at it simply as history, simply as a historic set of events that have taken place, I can happily say these things have been recorded accurately. They've been faithfully taken down, written down, and passed on. And that in the early times, these were corrected within the time frame that they could have been easily corrected by people who knew that it was untrue. In later times, people held to a desire to keep it consistent and holistic. Now, there's a whole lot of the story about Gnostic sects and other different groupings of people of Christianity who sought to actually use other bits of scripture, use other ways of looking at the world. Um, and so it was really important for the core body of believers to actually hold on to something that was true and reasonable. And so the scriptures we have um, are often firming those set of beliefs so that the world would actually know, yes, this is what we do believe. This is what we do accept. And on many occasions, the early church fathers had to actually um, write for their own lives and tell the story of Christianity because they were literally under the judge of Rome um, and the various parts of the empire who actually wanted to do away with Christianity. Along with the many um, various persecutions that followed. And all of this, people held to their belief, held to what they read and held to what they affirm. Even unto death was their story. Now, what is our story? Well, today, when we go about sharing our faith to people, a lot of people aren't really going to be worried about whether the Bible is realistic or whatever, because for them, everybody's truth is everybody's truth. So when we're sharing our faith, it is about sharing our narrative, just like the early Christians. What do we know? This is what I know. Jesus died on the cross. He was raised again. He was seen by 500 people. Okay. That 
changed the shape of the world as we know it. Now death no longer had the same hold that it had before. So our story is Christ in me. The things that have changed me, reshape me. It's my story as I share it. So when I go out as an apologetic to share my story, I am just that, literally telling my narrative of what Jesus did to me, how I met him, what he means to me now, who I believe he is, what I'm looking forward to. This is the faith we believe. And that faith shakes away the doubt that likely to come in. Now, I have glossed over a whole range of things because we could have sat down for several hours to talk in more detail. Uh, and there are some great books out there that I could recommend. Um, but for the moment, if you want to know, is this reliable? Then the answer is yes. It is reliable. You can trust it. Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, that you have given us a witness that allows us to be strong, that you've enabled us to be the people who we are. All these centuries later, your faith is still strong. Christianity is still following you. And for that, Lord, we give you thanks. And Lord, we continue to honour you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we pray that God will bless you, whatever you're doing today, wherever you're hiding out, and um, may you find your strength and joy in him, and we look forward to seeing you in the flesh. Thanks. <laughs>